covenant has been called the covenant of bondage as well as the covenant of works. Did God lead Israel out of bondage, out of Egypt, so that he could give them a covenant of bondage? This covenant is a covenant of works and bondage as we shall see. However, there's been a gross misrepresentation of the character of the God of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this misrepresentation of God and his character has been plaguing Adventism since before 1888. Now, a confrontation continued even after 1888, and in 1890, Ellen White was given light from heaven on who was correct on this issue. And only a few today subscribe to the view that was given from heaven, and I'm sure many of us are going to recognize it as we continue in this study. There are basically two ideas regarding the covenants, though there are many variations. One which teaches that the new covenant superseded the old covenant in AD 31 and another which teaches that the covenants have ran simultaneously from the fall and that the covenant was ratified the new covenant was ratified in AD 31 now shortly before 1888 many of the brethren including the president of the general conference G.I. Butler as well as Uriah Smith Dan Jones and D.M. Canwright they had a view concerning the covenants that taught that the covenants followed each other in two dispensations of time. The first dispensation of time was before the cross and the second dispensation of time was after the cross. Now this is a common view today. Many people believe in what is called dispensationalism. The covenants basically following one another. So this would be view one. The covenants follow each other, one spanning the time before the cross, the other the time after the cross. Um, here's what D.M. Canwright wrote in his study called the new covenant he said the new covenant dm canwright wrote in his study called the new covenant he said the new covenant or the gospel then began to be preached by jesus christ the mediator of the new covenant had now come to supersede the old covenant but jesus was careful to have the new covenant offered only to the jews because the lord had promised that this new covenant was to be made with the house of israel it's interesting to note what Canwright is saying here that the new covenant was only preached after the cross and the gospel was only began to be preached by Jesus Christ. D.M. Canwright rejected the 1888 message and shortly after this he became one of the greatest enemies of Ellen White. He believed the gospel was not even preached before Jesus Christ. That's what his quote says. Now Uriah Smith, he believed the same, and he also said the, the conclusion is therefore clear that these two covenants embody two grand divisions of the work which heaven has undertaken for human redemption and cover two special dispensations devoted to the development of this work. This is what, this is what Uriah Smith said regarding the, era, the covenants. He believed that there was two grand divisions of time which these covenants cover. And they believe that the first dispensation of time ended at the cross. That was where the old covenant ended. While well, second began at the cross, this is where the new covenant began. The second view, which Ellen called light from heaven, as we're going to look at here, is the view that both the old covenant and the new covenant have ran simultaneously since the fall of man. Here's what she says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 371. And we'll get to more of what she wrote on this. But she said that the covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 371. This was the view that E.J. Wagner was sharing. And E.J. Wagner and Ellen White both shared the same view. And here's what Wagner wrote. And uh, he wrote this in 1890. He said, The Christian dispensation began for man as soon at least as the fall. There are indeed two dispensations, a dispensation of sin and death, and a dispensation of righteousness and life. But these two dispensations have ran parallel from the fall. God deals with men as individuals and not as nations, nor according to the century in which they live. No matter what the period of the world's history, a man can at any time pass from the old dispensation into the new. So this is clear that it doesn't matter what period of time, whether it's A.D. 31 or after, you can still pass from the old dispensation to the new. And it's the same thing even before the cross. 
you could still pass from the old dispensation to the new. And this doesn't matter where in earth's history you could have stand. That these, these covenants, both of the covenants, old covenant and new covenant, were covenants made with your own lips. And they were individual covenants. And we're going to look at this. Because there's one covenant made with your own lips. And there's one covenant that were made by God's word. And that's the covenant that he will do in you what he's promised to do. And we're going to continue to look at this as we uh, go on here. Shortly before Ellen White received light from heaven on the topic of the covenants, Uriah Smith was not appreciating what was being distributed to the people by E.J. Wagner. The date was February 17th, 1890. Here's what Uriah Smith wrote in a letter to Ellen White on that date. That's, again, February 17th, 1890. He said, As it looks to me, next to the death of Brother James White, the greatest calamity that ever befell our cause was when Dr. Wagner put his articles on the book of Galatians through the signs. I suppose the questions of the law in Galatians was settled way back in 1856. I was surprised at the articles because they seemed to me then, and still seem to me, to contradict so directly what you wrote to J.H. Wagner. That's your I. Smith, letter to Ellen White. So, these articles to which Elder Smith was referring to were E.J. Wagner's nine-part series, Comments on Galatians 3. It ran through the sign of the times from July 8th to September 2nd of 1886. Now, back in the early 1850s, Ellen White put the brakes on J.H. Wagner. J.H. Wagner was teaching that the law in Galatians was the moral law. E.J. Wagner adapted the same teaching that it was the moral law in Galatians. However, Uriah Smith and G.I. Butler were teaching that it was the ceremonial law, which is being spoken of in the book of Galatians. Now, Uriah Smith continued regarding Wagner's position. Here's what he said regarding his position on Galatians. He said, This position on Galatians, which I deem as erroneous, he, E.J. Wagner, took his position on Galatians, the same which you had condemned in his father, J.H. Wagner. So he was sure that the law in Galatians was her issue with J.H. Wagner. But was that the issue? Let's keep reading. Ellen White replied to Uriah Smith within a few weeks. And she spoke regarding both E.J. Wagner's view on the law as well as J.H. Wagner's view. And here's what she said. And this is dated March 8th, 1990. This is about three weeks later. She said, As to the law in Galatians, I have no burden and never have. She didn't have an issue with the view on the law in Galatians. That was not her burden. That was not her burden with either E.J. Wagner and as Uriah Smith is speaking about here, J.H. Wagner. That was not her issue. Ellen always accepted Wagner's position regarding the law in Galatians. She actually said, I am asked concerning the law in Galatians, what law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? I answer both the ceremonial and the moral code of Ten Commandments. She accepted both of the Wagner's views regarding the Ten Commandments. So then why did Ellen White put the brakes on J.H. Wagner in earlier years and not on E.J. Wagner? Why did she take an issue with what J.H. Wagner's view on Galatians? Well, J.H. Wagner had taken a dispensational view on the covenants, similar to that of Butler and Smith, which was very different to that of which E.J. Wagner was teaching. J.H. Wagner said, this he said we know that the te new testament or covenant dates from the death of the testator the very point where the first covenant ceased that's jh wagner from his article new covenant dated march 26 1853 so he believes that the first covenant ceased at the cross this is very different to what ej wagner was teaching and ej wagner was teaching that both covenants ran parallel and simultaneously since the fall of man Now, shortly after receiving Uriah Smith's letter from February 17th of 1890, Ellen is given light from heaven regarding the issue of the covenants. She explains that the covenant view presented by E.J. Wagner is the truth, and that this issue is clear and will be received by every candid and unprejudiced mind. The light is plain, and these men, including Uriah Smith, G.I. Butler, 
Dan Jones, Brother Porter, had rejected this plain light, which is light from heaven. Let's read this letter from, dated March 8, 1890. This is about three weeks after the issue with she wrote to Uriah Smith. Here's what she said. Night before last, I was shown that evidence in regard to the covenants were clear and convincing. Yourself, Brother Dan Jones, Brother Porter, and others are spending your investigative powers for naught to produce a view or position on the covenants to vary from the position that Brother Wagner has presented. Had you received the true light which shineth, you would not have imitated or gone over the same manner of interpretation and misconstruing the scriptures as did the Jews. What made them so zealous? Why did they hang on the words of Christ? Why did spies follow him to mark his words that they could repeat, misinterpret, and twist in a way to mean that which their own unsanctified minds would make them mean? In this way they deceived the people. They made false issues. They handled those things that they could make a means of clouding and misleading minds. The covenant question is a clear question and would be received by every candid, unprejudiced mind. But I was brought where the Lord gave me an insight into this matter. You have turned from plain light because you were afraid that the law question in Galatians would have to be accepted. As to the law in Galatians, I have no burden and never have. So here we see that they had went over the same ground that the Jews did. They deceived the people. They made false issues. And this is what's going on today. Is that the issue of the covenants has not been accepted. And there's many people that are going to make false issues on, these, on this issue. Even though it's going to be plain. And it's going to be presented clearly here. As Ellen White did. We're, and so did E.J. Wagner. There's going to be false issues presented. God gave her insight into this matter. Which we will read about in Patriarchs and Prophets shortly. The, the book Patriarchs and Prophets came into print shortly after the light was given to her on the covenant issue. But she was not done speaking to Uriah Smith on this matter. She also said, in regards to this, she said, You have strengthened the hands and the minds of such men as Larson, Porter, Dan Jones, Eldridge, and Morrison, and Nicola, and a vast number through them. All quote you, and the enemy of righteousness looks on pleased. And this is what's happening today. We have the same problems. Today we have men who are teaching very similar. They're strengthening the hands and minds of many men against the truth on the covenant issue when it's been revealed so plainly. Many who have not studied this topic quote these men and the enemy looks on pleased. Many are not clear on this topic. They haven't studied the issue out. Uriah Smith did not want to accept this light because he knew that by accepting this light he would have to accept Wagner's view on the Long Galatians as well as his view on under the law. Because of misconceptions, Uriah Smith was not ready to repent of this error, even with the light from heaven on this issue. Here's what Ellen White wrote on March 8, 1890 in the same letter. She said, If you turn from one, way of one ray of light, fearing it will necessitate an acceptance of positions you do not wish to receive, that light becomes to you darkness, that if you were in error, you would honestly assert it to be truth. Basically, she's saying if you accept this over here, then you're going to have to accept this over here, and you don't want to do that. And that was the issue that was happening in 1888. And some of the men were saying, if we say amen to this, then we're going to have to say amen to the law issue. They didn't want to say amen to the covenant issue, because then they would have to say amen to the law issue. And there was more to, to what Wagner was saying with regards to the law issue as well. He had many things to say on the law issue that we don't accept today as well. On March 9, 1890, the brakes came off for E.J. Wagner to present his view on the covenants. Regarding Wagner's view on the covenants, shortly after the letter to Uriah Smith, Ellen White wrote to Willie. She had years earlier put the brakes on, on J.H. Wagner, but now light had been given from heaven, and she was shown that E.J. Wagner was right on this issue. Here's what she said regarding Wagner's view on the covenants and the law in Galatians, and regarding the brakes that are coming off. She says, I have no brakes to put on now. I stand in perfect freedom calling light light and darkness darkness. 
I told them yesterday that the position of the covenants I believed as presented in my volume 1, Patriarchs and Prophets, if that was Dr. Wagner's position, then he had the truth. Now, March 10th, 1890, Ellen White spoke to other, spoke on others presenting Wagner's view on the covenants. Ellen was very pleased to find out that others were sharing Wagner's view on the covenants. And she made this known again, writing to Willie White. She, she spoke of the issue of the covenants being a controversial topic, and many were using Miss White to teach that Wagner was wrong by speaking about when Ellen had put the brakes on J.H. Wagner. She speaks about this below regarding Uriah Smith's view. But when she finally broke silence on this issue, this was a great relief to many minds. And here's what she said. She said, I'm much pleased to learn that Professor Prescott is giving the same lessons in his class to the students that Brother Wagner has been giving. He is presenting the covenants. Since I made the statement last Sabbath that the view of the covenants as it had been taught by Brother Wagner was truth, it seems that great relief has come to many minds. Now, there were still people hanging on to Brother Smith and his dispensational covenant views. Uriah Smith rejected the light from heaven regarding the covenants, and he continued to reject the light and to publish anti-Wagner articles up until at least 1902. By the 1930s, Wagner's views on the covenants, as presented by Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets, became virtually unknown, at least in public, published periodicals. Regarding Uriah Smith and his hanging on to his dispensational view on the covenants, in her sermon from March 8, 1890, Ellen said this, she said, The light that came to me night before last laid it all open again before me, just the influence that was at work and just where it would lead. You are just going over the same ground that they went over in the days of Christ. You have had their experience, but God deliver us. You have stood right in the way of God. The earth is to be lighted with His glory, and if you stand where you stand today, you might just as quick say that the Spirit of God was the Spirit of the Devil. Do not hang on to Brother Smith. In the name of God, I tell you, he is not in the light. He has not been in the light since he was at Minneapolis. Let the truth of God come into your hearts. Open the door. Now I tell you before God that the covenant question as it has been presented is the truth. She likened this to standing in the way, standing, this standing in the way of the view on the covenants that Wagner was presenting to standing in the way of the angel that was to give the loud cry message and to lighten the earth with God's glory. She likened it to standing in the way of God himself. Again, she insists that the covenant view presented to her only a couple nights before was the truth and was light from heaven. Now, only a few months later was Patriarchs and Prophets released. But let me ask you a question before we read what, what was written in Patriarchs and Prophets. Is it possible that perhaps you're standing in the way of God? Is it possible that perhaps you are standing in the way of the light from heaven? I believe that there's many ministers that are standing in the way of this light today. The book Patriarchs and Prophets was released August 26, 1890. We're going to look at some statements from this book from the chapter of the Law and the Covenants, and I recommend that everyone goes and reads this chapter carefully. Now, let's look at this. When was the new covenant made with man? And we're going to quote from page 370 of Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, The covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden. This same covenant was renewed to Abraham. This promise pointed Christ. So Abraham understood it. See Galatians 8 and 6, 3, 8 and 16. And he trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It was this faith that was accounted unto him for righteousness. The covenant with Abraham also maintained the authority of God's law. Now, today many are insisting that the laws was not binding in those days before Sinai and after the cross, which is another great mistake. And I'd just like to look at a quote from Ellen White called The Law of God regarding the statutes and the commandments of God. They will be binding as long as time should last, and they are to govern forever. We are under that government, and some people are saying we're no longer under a government of law anymore, and this is a false teaching. Listen to this quote. It says, In consequence of continual transgression, the moral law was repeated in awful grandeur from Sinai. That means it was there before Sinai. 
Christ gave to Moses religious precepts which were to govern the everyday life. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. They didn't pass away at the cross. They were to be binding upon man in every age as long as time should last. These commands were enforced by the power of the moral law, and they clearly and definitely explain that law. And if they clearly and definitely explain that law, we have no reason or right. We should not be in ignorance regarding God's law, because it's clear. It's definitely explained. So clearly, the law was given at Mount Sinai, however, it was repeated at Mount Sinai. What's the reason for the Old Covenant? Let's, let's read on. In Patriarchs and Prophets, we look at pages 371. It says, Another compact called in Scripture the Old Covenant was formed between God and Israel at Sinai and was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. The Abrahamic Covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ. But if the Abrahamic Covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? In their bondage, the people had to a great extent lost the knowledge of God and of the principles of the Abrahamic Covenant. In delivering them from Egypt, God sought to reveal to them His power and His mercy that they might be led to love and trust Him. He brought them down to the Red Sea where, pursued by the Egyptians, escape seemed impossible, that they might realize their utter helplessness, their need of divine aid, and then He wrought deliverance for them. Thus they were filled with love and gratitude to God and with confidence in His power to help them. He had bound them to Himself as their deliverer from temporal bondage. Living in the midst of idolatry and corruption, they had no true conception of the holiness of God, the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law and their need of a Savior. All this they must be taught. Notice here that God is attempting to give them a knowledge of Himself and His covenant of grace. Knowledge of God and His Son is not all that we need. We need knowledge of His character, of how He delivers us from bondage. This is a key in regards to knowledge of God. Now God had promised the new covenant which He had made already with Adam and Abraham. Let's look at Exodus 6, 2-8. Here's what it says. It says, And God spake unto Moses, and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I also have established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant, his covenant. Wherefore, saying to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you for me a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in under the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Now here obviously it was a temporal heritage he was going to give them, but he wanted to rid them out of their bondage. And this covenant that was given to Abraham was a covenant of grace. It was a covenant of faith. This covenant was a covenant where God would establish them, not of themselves lest they should boast, but rather by grace through faith. This was the covenant God intended to renew with them. But because of their misunderstanding of God's requirements, they thought that this fulfillment of the law was something that was of themselves. They didn't accept that God would work in them, and they entered into a covenant established by their own promise, rather than the promises of God. And let's look at what else Ellen White has to say on this issue on page 371 and page 372 of Patriarchs and Prophets. She says, God brought them to Sinai. He manifested His glory. He gave them His law with the promise of great blessings on conditions of obedience. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts, that without Christ it was impossible for them to keep God's law. They readily entered into covenant with God, feeling that they were able to establish their own righteousness. They declared, 
All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Exodus 24, 7. So here they entered into a covenant of works, one which they believed they could fulfill. The people didn't realize the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ it was impossible for them to do God's law. They, they thought that they were going to do this for themselves and they didn't recognize God's character. Many understand this covenant to go from Sinai to the cross and this is what God ordained. I think that if we misunderstand this, we could be making a covenant of works easily. This covenant of works lasted only a few weeks before they broke it. Then they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant which was made with Adam and Abraham. Let's keep reading. Um, it's, let, let's keep reading from Patriarchs and Prophets here. It says, God leads Israel to accept the new covenant. Let's talk about this. It says, Only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image. That was how long it lasted, a few weeks. They could not hope for the favor of God through a covenant which they had broken. And now, seeing their sinfulness and their need of pardon, they were brought to feel their need of the Savior revealed in the Abrahamic covenant and shouted forth in the sacrificial offerings. Now by faith and love, they were bound to God and their deliverer from the bondage of sin. Now they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant. Now, notice above it says a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant. That was their covenant. God's covenant was different. Their covenant was their own words. God's covenant was His promises. Their promises were no good. God's covenant and promises were good. Now, let's look at, let's keep reading. And it says, the terms of the old covenant were obey and live. The new covenant was established upon better promises the promise of forgiveness of sins and of the grace of God to renew the heart and bring it into harmony with the principle of God's law. So this covenant was established on better promises. This covenant was established on the promise of God. The other covenant, the old covenant, was established on the promise of them. Their promise was all that the Lord has said we will do. And their promise was good as nothing. It was a useless promise. Does God make a promise that He can't keep? No, so their promise was useless. His promise was good. And his promise was better. The better promise. Now, the rejection of the covenants as revealed from heaven led to a rejection of the testimonies. Many today are saying that Wagner was wrong and Ellen White was wrong to support him in this aspect of his teaching regarding the covenant being given to Israel. Brother Dan Jones had come to this conclusion that Ellen was wrong. And here's what he said to Willie and Mary White on March 16, 1890. She said, Brother Dan Jones then spoke. He stated that he had been tempted to give up the testimonies. But if he did this, he knew he should yield everything. For we had regarded the testimonies as interwoven with the third angel's message. And he spoke of terrible scenes of temptations. I really pitied the man. Sadly, when rejecting the understanding of the covenant issue, many were coming to reject that the testimonies were from God himself. The same thing is happening today to those who are ready to say Wagner was wrong and Ellen White was wrong. They go on, usually, to reject the testimonies. Here's what she went on to state. She said, The law in Galatians was their only plea. Why, I asked, is your interpretation of the law in Galatians more dear to you and more zealous to maintain your ideas on this point than to acknowledge the workings of the Spirit of God? You've been weighing every precious heaven-sent testimony by your own scales as you interpreted the law in Galatians. Nothing could come to you in regard to the truth and the power of God unless it should bear your imprint. The precious ideas you have idolized on the law of Galatians. These testimonies of the Spirit of God, the fruits of the Spirit of God, have no weight unless they are stamped with your ideas on the law in Galatians. I am afraid of you and I am afraid of your interpretation of any scripture which has revealed itself in such an unchristlike spirit as you have manifested and has caused so much unnecessary labor. If you are such very cautious men and so very critical lest you shall receive something not in accordance with the scriptures, I want your minds to look on these things in the true light. Let your caution be exercised in the line of fear lest you are committing the sin against the Holy Ghost. Have your critical minds taken this view on the subjects I say, 
If your views on the Long Galatians and the fruits are of the character I have seen in Minneapolis and ever since up to this time, my prayer is that I may be as far from your understanding and interpretation of the scriptures as it is possible for me to be. I am afraid of any application of scripture that needs such a spirit and bears such fruit as you have manifested. One thing is certain, I shall never come into harmony with such a spirit as long as God gives me my reason. Now, brethren, I have nothing to say, no burden in regard to the law in Galatians. This matter looks to me of minor consequence in comparison with the spirit you have brought into your faith. It is exactly of the same peace that was manifested by the Jews in reference to the work and mission of Jesus Christ. The most convincing testimony that we can bear to others that we have the truth is the spirit which attends the advocacy of that truth. If it sanctifies the heart of the receiver, if it makes him gentle, kind, forbearing, true, and Christ-like, then he will give some evidence of the fact that he has the genuine truth. But if he acts as did the Jews when their opinions and ideas were crossed, then we certainly cannot receive such testimony, for it does not produce the true fruits of righteousness. Their own interpretations of Scripture were not correct, and yet the Jews would, not, would receive no evidence from the revelation of the Spirit of God, but would their ideas were contradicted even murder the Son of God. It's a letter to Mary White and uh, Willie White again. That was March 16, 1890. Some, even when the spirit of prophecy and the testimony showed that they were wrong, would not give up their own interpretations, and when given by revelation of the Spirit of God, they would not let go. Ellen White had become afraid of them because of their misinterpretation of Galatians. Paul said in Galatians 4.11, He said, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed labor on you in vain. There was a reason that Paul had become afraid of them. is because of their rejection of the gospel. They believed that what they were teaching of the covenants was the truth. But this belief turned God into a monstrosity who put people under a system of bondage before the cross. And thus this monstrous character that was portrayed of God was becoming their own. And this was becoming their own towards their brethren, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, as revealed in 1890. In 1890, Ellen White had said that the spirit of Christ was rejected and the spirit of devils accepted. And she went on further in her sermon on March 8, 1890 to say that by failing to cherish the spirit of Christ, by taking wrong positions in the controversy over the law in Galatians, a question that many have not fully understood before taking a wrong position, the church has sustained a sad loss. She also said on February 27, 1891, she said, I'm forced by the attitude of my brethren of taken and the spirit evidence to say, God deliver me from your ideas of the law in Galatians. Sadly, God was not in this work, and many men were taken from the true work that could have been done had the leading men of that time followed the light. And there's a similar issue today. And here's what she says in 1894. She said this to Elder Haskell. She said, the Lord's work needed every jot and tittle of experience that he had given Elder Butler and Elder Smith but they have taken their own course in some things irrespective of the light that God has given. And history today is only repeating itself one more time. Now the question is, what side are we going to be on today? Obviously, if this is light from heaven, as revealed through the prophet, we have, we have to stand on this side, standing up for not only that, but for the testimonies, because without the testimonies, strong delusion is coming in among us in many forms. And... I believe that this is of utter importance, especially this issue on the covenants, because it reveals the truth regarding righteousness by faith through the God, grace of God, the covenant of grace. And if we don't understand that God has always worked in this manner with every people, we will have a misconception of who our God is, and knowledge of God will be missing in our lives. Right.